Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Gen3 webinar hosted by the National Cancer Institute's Data Common Framework Services. My name is Andre Paredes, and I'll be moderating today's event. Thank you for joining us today. We will, be, we will be discussing the framework services and how it enables interoperability across ecosystems. During this webinar, we will dive into the technical details of Gen3's open source implementation of framework services, including authentication, authorization, and standards via global alliances such as GA4GH. This event is being recorded, so all attendees will be muted. We kindly ask that all attendees remain muted so that we can share the recording. Please submit questions to the chat. It'll be addressed at the end of the presentation. You can address it to everybody or you can address it just to me. Our presenters for this webinar will be Chris Meyer, User Services Lead, Jachi Liu, a tech lead for NCI DCFS, and Alexander Van Tol, a lead for engineering. At this time, I'll give it over to Chris. Thanks, Andre. Um, again, my name is Chris Meyer. I'm the user services lead at the Center for Translational Data Science at University of Chicago. Um, and I'd like to also thank everyone for joining our webinar today. And I, I hope you'll learn some useful information about the framework services being developed here. <clears throat> um, as the title of our talk shows, we are going to be talking about interoperability and uh, how the framework services developed here uh, enable interoperability. So we're talking about interoperability of data resources. And a data resource can be defined as any type of cyber infrastructure that provides users access to stored data. Um, when we talk about data commons in particular though, uh, we're specifically talking about cyber infrastructure that co-locates data storage with computational resources like software services, tools, and applications for exploring, analyzing, and sharing data. There are certain attributes that we believe data commons should have, like being modular, community-driven, and open source and standards-based. Um, one of the great developments we've seen uh, is that data commons are becoming more popular, uh, which is a great boon for the scientific and medical research communities. However, as the number of data commons continues to grow, we believe it's critical to establish some principles so that data commons can interoperate. And the concept of interoperation is that researchers can access, explore, and integrate data stored across multiple data commons or data resources. Um, interoperating data commons in this way is a critical step towards creating a data ecosystem. Uh, wherein individual data commons don't operate as isolated data silos, but rather become nodes in an interconnected uh, network of resources. So the, the um, image that Andre has up there of the framework services um, demonstrates the uh, core set of software services required to enable a data commons to store data and provide users a way to discover and access that data. Through conformance to technical guidelines and operating principles, the framework services enable a data commons to interoperate with other resources that make up the data ecosystem. These technical guidelines are best informed by standards and best practices developed collaboratively by groups such as uh, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, or GA4GH, or for example, the NCI Cancer Research Data Commons, or CRDC, among others. Uh, over time, the hope is that different groups developing these standards can converge on a minimal set of technical guidelines and operating principles for building data commons that are interoperable uh, and flexible enough to adapt to changes in technology over time. Uh, by developing uh, a simple and standardized framework services for common basic functions like user authentication and authorization, minting unique digital IDs for metadata and data file objects, and ingestion and export of clinical data, et cetera. Um, those functions you see there in the middle labeled data commons framework services. Uh, through doing this, more complex data ecosystems can arise uh, that support collections of third party applications that run over the open APIs provided by the services. And those, um, that rich uh, collection of resources there would be on the left and right side of the data commons framework services in this diagram. Uh, under this model, operators of individual data resources don't need to develop their own custom user interfaces and analysis applications. Instead, by providing these open APIs, 
the wider community of scientists and data analysts and web developers can utilize the common protocols exposed by the framework services open APIs to develop a rich collection of user facing applications for functions like data ingestion, exploration and analysis that work across data resources. Here we see uh, some core technical principles that enable interoperability that uh, we believe all framework services should follow. First, in order to facilitate reproducibility of research, data must be associated with unique and persistent digital identifiers. Uh, we expect that over time, data will move between different host names or cloud providers, and by using persistent digital IDs, data can be discovered via these IDs even when it moves. Within the DCFS, or the Data Commons Framework Services, this is achieved by using prefixes and GUIDs, uh, or globally unique IDs. Second, data must be exposed through an API so that other systems and applications can build on top of these foundational services to power data ecosystems. Third, data must be ingested conforming to or along with a data model that defines the way data are organized and describes its properties so that external researchers can understand and properly interpret that data for reuse. Fourth, Authentication and authorization must be standardized, secure, and consistent across platforms. The framework services supports trusted third-party authentication providers such as Google, ERA Commons, and InCommons, among others. And finally, all trusted resources within the ecosystem should abide by similar security and compliance standards. The ecosystem is only as secure as its weakest link. So, uh, for systems to interoperate, there must be an understanding that they'll share similar levels of security. And with that said, I'll now pass off the presentation to our software technical lead, Jachi Liu, uh, who is going to be discussing some of the more technical details for us. Uh, thank you, Chris. I am going to start my screen share. Uh, so uh, I'll go into a little bit more about the implementation of uh, framework services within Gen3. Uh, so many of you on this uh, webinar may already be familiar with Gen3, uh, but I wanted to introduce our core product offerings. So Gen3 is an open source uh, solution that the um, team here at the University of Chicago at the Center for Translational Data Sciences maintains. Um, Gen3 is an open source solution for framework services and data commons. Um, for the framework services portion, which we'll focus on mostly today, uh, Gen3 supports an authentication and authorization service called Fence, uh, a policy engine called Arborist, a data indexing solution called IndexD, as well as a, a suite of automation tools for um, setting up these services on the Kubernetes cluster, as well as um, you know, being able to diagnose issues with services running on the open source platform. Uh, in addition to these services, uh, as part of our data commons, uh, we also have our uh, front-facing data portal for querying data which is the windmill, as well as our workspaces, which support multiple compute frameworks, such as Jupyter Notebooks and our studio for running an analytics over our data set. Our command line tool, which is a suite of uh, command line tools for accessing some of our framework services APIs and our Docker Compose service, again, for supporting automation uh, and being able to run your own Gen3 instance. Uh, our data services include um, our underlying ETL service, which is known as Tube, um, as well as being able to support um, interfacing with our data over a GraphQL interface uh, and submitting uh, data dictionaries via uh, Sheepdog and Peregrine. So that's kind of a high level overview of all of our uh, core products and services. Um, you can find out more about these services on our GitHub page. Um, but today we'll talk mostly about our framework services implementation. Uh, so the overall architecture of our framework services, um, as I mentioned, we have um, the on the authentication authorization side, we have uh, an identity provider for authentication, uh, and then we have an authorization service. Um, so that logic is consistent within uh, our service called Fence. 
We also have a policy engine which stores the source of truth for what users have access to, what resources they are allowed to access, uh, and that is known as Arborist. Uh, and we have our data indexing service for accessing uh, file objects in cloud storage, uh, as well as indexing and maintaining um, GUIDs, so globally unique identifiers and persistent identifiers for these file objects. Uh, something that is new to the framework services is our metadata API, which links the uh, GUIDs from the file data with metadata associated with the file objects. And we'll talk a little bit more about that throughout the presentation. All right, now that you kind of know what the uh, general architecture looks like, uh, I'll dive a little bit deeper into the standards uh, that we follow within NCI DCFS and within the Gen 3 implementation of framework services to allow for interoperability. Um, there are two key standards uh, or two key uh, global standards that we will talk about today. So we'll talk about some of the standards being worked on by the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, also known as GA4GH. Um, as well as the general uh, internet protocols um, that are sort of standard across the board for OpenID Connect and OAuth 2.0, uh, both of which are um, standards used in authentication and authorization. By complying with these global standards uh, in both you know, genomics, which is sort of our own field, as well as the general internet protocols, we are then able to interoperate across other systems, other APIs, um, and interoperate with other compute platforms working with genomic and scientific data. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the GA4GH data repository service. This is most relevant to the framework services and very key that the framework services has a appropriate implementation because it relates to discovering uh, data. So this is where, um, you know, to Chris's point about having persistent identifiers, the data repository service allows researchers to discover and access data in a consistent way um, such that research can be reproducible. So, uh, you know, going back to the architecture, we have the Gen3 data indexing service, which is index D. Uh, index D is responsible for indexing the data, which allows the data to be easily identified and located using the globally unique and persistent identifiers. So how does index D do this? Um, index D issues GUIDs for any new data or uploads to data uh, in a physical uh, bucket in the cloud. So these GUIDs have two components. One is the prefix, you'll see here, it's DG.4503. Um, and the prefix is an opaque identifier that will stay consistent regardless of the host name of the server uh, where index D is hosted. And then there's a unique identifier uh, following the prefix that is unique to that particular file. Uh, in addition to do it, index D also supports aliases, which might be IDs generated by some other uh, indexing service or some other standard uh, that link to this particular GUID. Um, so with the introduction of the DIRS standard within GA4GH, we've implemented the two DIRS APIs to index D. So there is a get objects uh, with the object ID, which in this case is the GUID, and the, um, and the access endpoint for getting a signed URL. And the preferred method of accessing byte data within uh, Gen 3's implementation of framework services is through signed URLs. Uh, signed URLs are short-lived URLs that allow you to download directly from a cloud storage. Both uh, Google Cloud and Amazon Web Services support signed URLs. Uh, within the DIRS standard, um, there are two endpoints, as explained in the previous slide. Uh, in the first endpoint, in the objects endpoint, uh, index C will provide the location of the file object, 
with some additional file metadata as well. Uh, this endpoint is open access, and uh, as long as you're not getting direct access to the byte data, um, you know, you're allowed to look at file metadata. For getting access to signed URLs, and in particular getting access to signed URLs for controlled data sets, um, you will have to go through an authentication and authorization flow. Users can authenticate through the framework services, uh, and they will be able to get a OAuth 2.0 access token from Fence. Uh, they would then use this token uh, and place it in the header of the call to the DCF third server. And given the uh, persistent identifier, the object ID, as well as the uh, authorization token, and then the access ID, which is provided in the file metadata, the user is able to make a call to the access endpoint and get a signed URL. If the user is not authorized to access set data, then index C will have to return an access denied. Um, so at the bottom of this screen, you see an example um, of an API call to the objects endpoint. Here is an example payload for a single ob file object uh, response from the DIRS server. Uh, this is compliant with the their spec, um, which is currently at version 1.0. Uh, and it provides the location of this uh, file object in both Google Cloud, as well as Amazon Web Services, uh, as well as some file metadata, such as the checksum, size, um, version, et cetera. For accessing signed URLs, uh, users will be using the GA4GH uh, object slash access endpoint. Um, so in this endpoint, the GUID would be placed um, within the endpoint itself, and then the access ID is something that you can get out of the uh, initial um, object endpoint. So I'm going to go back really quick, and you can see that in the access methods, there is an access ID defined for this particular GUID. So um, in the API call here, you will specify whether you want the Google Cloud version of this file or the Amazon Web Services version uh, through the access ID, and they are both the same, of course. Uh, so as a response object, you will get a URL that contains, um, that is assigned URL for you to download the byte object. Uh, coming soon, um, and also part of their standard, is something called bundles. Bundle is a nested layer of uh, DIRS objects and that can contain other bundles itself. Uh, so bundles will be implemented within index D as part of the GA4GH DIRS server. And we will also support the expansion of bundles um, in the content objects array as uh, specified by the DIRS spec. Um, and then you can see sort of in the example that a bundle is pretty loosely defined. You can uh, specify objects uh, to be within a bundle uh, as well as bundles itself to be within a bundle. Um, so with there's URIs and consistency around persistent identifiers, uh, we will eventually have the opportunity to be able to, let's say, package a cohort from a data portal uh, import it as a bulk clinical file in a portable format known as um, the uh, portable format for biomedical data, uh, the PFB, and then you can index it and assign a DERS URI. That DERS URI is what will allow other analytics platforms to call the DERS API and be able to fetch um, the file object. By leveraging DERS URIs that are persistent um, and that use persistent identifiers, we can support reproducible research because that data can be consistently accessed over and over again. I'm going to dive into another standard um, within GA4GH that framework services will be implementing. Um, DERS is something that is currently live within framework services right now. The passports and visas is something that we are currently working on and we're very excited to support. Uh, so within GA4GH, um, this is passports and visas refer to a standard for accessing or I guess accessing information about a user's authorization. Um, so a passport is actually an identity that travels with the researcher across data platforms, across commons, across framework services. 
and contains a collection of visas. A passport represents the identity of the researcher, so the authentication side. A visa is an assertion that is signed by a visa issuer, and a visa issuer is an authority figure such as the NIH um, that grants researchers access to data. Uh, so a visa is on the authorization side of um, OFN and OFC. <coughs> a visa is designed for machine interpretation only, uh, and the passport and visa spec is meant to be uh, compliant with OpenID Connect, which we will also talk about later. Um, I can't dive too deep into passports and visas without talking a little bit about JWT tokens. Uh, in our previous webinar about framework services, we uh, went in depth on authorization, authentication, data access. Um, so if you wanna learn more about JWT tokens, please refer to the previous webinar. Um, but it is a part of the um, OpenID Connect standard, uh, and it's also leveraged by GA4GH passports and visas. Um, this is especially important because visas itself can be encoded as an embedded JWT token. And because of this is a, a known standard um, across the board, any API services that use JWT tokens, they are able to verify the signature of these tokens, verify that it's valid and signed by the appropriate issuer um, through these open source libraries and within uh, FENCE. Um, as part of integrating with passports and visas, we will want to verify that visas signed by the NIH are truly signed by the NIH. Uh, this is directly from the J4GH Dairy Passport spec, uh, spec, and it documents sort of the, the notion of the, the passport, um, the passport claim itself and within a passport, um, you can have uh, visas uh, supporting that passport claim. Um, so within FENCE, when we support passports and visas, we will be providing FENCE signed uh, passports through the user info endpoints when scoped to GA4GH underscore passport underscore V1. Uh, and that will provide uh, the user with, I guess, the visas associated with their access. Uh, from an architecture perspective, um, there are different services and these services have different responsibilities when it comes to using passports and visas. Um, so for the framework services, uh, when interoperating with visa issuers to compile information about users' access, uh, this could be when FENCE is talking to an NIH service to understand what that user is allowed, to, which PHS IDs that users are allowed to have access to. Uh, in that scenario, FENCE acts as a passport broker. Um, but when we are interpreting and enforcing that authorization information um, that we get from the visas, such as when a user makes a call to our third server using their uh, FENCE access token, uh, we have to check that their visas truly have access to the data they're trying to download. Um, in that sense, FENCE is acting as a passport clearinghouse. Uh, so visas and passports are pretty exciting, um, you know, new standards around um, authentication authorization, but everything's still built on top of the existing OIDC and OAuth 2.0 protocols, uh, which I will hand off to uh, Alex, our lead software engineer, to talk about. Thanks, Chachi, and hey, everybody. Um, thank you for joining. Uh, so my name is Alex Van Tol. I'm one of the lead engineers here at the center working on the Gen3 software. Um, and I'm gonna delve a bit more into the details of some of the standards that we've adopted um, for the framework services, being OIDC um, and OAuth 2. And then I'm also gonna touch on the new metadata API that was mentioned. Um, I think the, the theme today is worth reiterating. Um, the idea of interoperability is really not only the theme of just this webinar, but it's really the theme and the driving force behind a lot of the decisions in, in how we do our framework services. 
And so, again, to reiterate, the framework services are a subset of, of what we offer um, for the Gen3 platform um, that is open source. And we, wherever possible, adopt accepted standards, um, even if they are emerging. So we talked about GA4GH. Um, a lot of these standards are, are being developed and are, are very new, but we are eager to adopt them um, because when a lot of players in the space adopt them, that, that means that there's going to be more interoperability. And so that's why um, we try to adopt things as they emerge. Um, but there are well accepted standards that already exist. So OIDC and OAuth2 um, have been around for a while and they're uh, very popular in uh, lots of different parts um, of the internet. Um, so if you're not familiar, I'm gonna talk a little bit of just about um, what these are and where you may have seen them before. And then I'll talk about how we have added them into our system and what it means for Gen 3 to, to use these protocols. Um, so OAuth 2 um, was the first kind of uh, modern protocol that allowed an application to securely access resources on behalf of a user. And what that means is, um, some third party system could request information about you in Google, let's say, without you giving them your username and password. And so it's a secure way for you to allow other systems to get information about you or to do things on your behalf in a different system. And so if you've ever seen a login with Google button on a non-Google website or a login with Microsoft or login with GitHub on a, a non-GitHub website, um, probably behind the scenes, what that's doing is using um, OAuth or OpenID Connect, which I'll talk about in a second. And so if you've ever seen one of these screens presented to you, um, this kind of consent screen, which is basically saying, you know, this example app would like to know some basic information about your Google profile. Do you want them, do you want to allow them to do that? By hitting allow, what you're allowing is those two different systems to interact with each other um, so that things can happen on your behalf. And Gen3 uh, has a very similar consent screen. And the way that we use it, um, the most common way that, that a client interacts with our system is to get access to controlled data. So a researcher may have access to specific data that's been indexed by Gen3 um, into our framework services. And there may be a different portal or um, in the CRDC context, a different um, data resource that perhaps wants to run some analysis or do some searching of data on behalf of a, a given user. And so the way that, that that client or that other application interacts with Gen 3 is through this protocol. Um, and I'll talk about the, the steps to make that happen. Um, so OpenID Connect is really just a layer built on top of OAuth 2 that adds more standards around identity and authentication, so knowing who a user is, um, which again helps with uh, providing more secure interoperability between systems. So really OpenID Connect is a, a standard that is a superset of, of OAuth 2. It, it adds more to it, but it retains all of uh, what OAuth 2 had already um, standardized. And so this is what we're adhering to in uh, the framework services. And so a typical flow for like what this actually means between the systems and what the interactions are, um, there's kind of three players. There's the researcher here in the middle, there's the client application. So this is like a cloud resource or some external data portal that is not Gen 3. And then there's the, the framework services. And in this case, um, it's the fence microservice that is um, allowing this flow, um, this OIDC flow to happen. And so from, from the perspective of the user, this is very simple, but behind the scenes, there's a lot of handshaking going on between the systems to ensure that um, the user is who they say they are, that the client is who they say they are, um, and that we can securely grant access um, in a temporary way to that client to act on the user's behalf. And so what happens is the client is going to send an initial request to the framework services that's saying, hey, I have this user who wants to do something in your system. Can you uh, verify who they are and then let me act on their behalf? And so we then have the user log in and we use third party identity providers. So what I mean by that is Fence does not store usernames or passwords. Um, we rely on external systems to handle that. And so in most cases, um, 
and definitely in the CRDC case, that identity provider is um, NIH login or your ERA Commons ID. Um, but Fence itself is configurable in that it can support Google login, Microsoft in Commons, Orc ID, a number of others. Um, but for most cases where we're handling dbGaP data, um, that's going to be your NIH login with your ERA Commons ID. Um, so we, the user logs in through ERA, through a handshake with them, we can verify that that user is who they say they are. Um, we're, we send back a code to the client, they then exchange that code to get tokens. These tokens, probably the most important one, is this refresh token. Essentially what the refresh token is, is a, a long-lived way that this client can then interact with our public API on behalf of this user. And in a practical sense, that means that this client can request signed URLs for specific file objects that we've indexed in our system um, to run some analysis um, for a given user. And so that's the, the flow that enables that kind of controlled um, access to data without sharing of actual passwords. Uh, so like I mentioned, um, Fence uh, and the framework services in general are configurable as to what our authentication provider or identity provider actually is. Um, so you'll see a smattering of different options. Um, uh, Google, Microsoft, Incommon, uh, ERA, and eventually RAS. Um, so for the CRDC, right now we have ERA or your NIH login, and then we're working on uh, adding RAS as the new identity provider. Um, within the framework services. Okay, so I'm gonna shift gears now and talk a bit about the new metadata API that was mentioned. So this is a new API that's added to our framework services that allows clients to search for and retrieve schemaless JSON blobs that represent additional metadata for uh, GUIDs, which are the persistent identifiers that we assign to file objects within the system. Um, so that's a, a lot to take in. So I'm going to try and break down what I mean by metadata because I think um, I know that it's kind of a loaded term and depending on the context in which you, you say metadata, it can mean many, many different things. Um, and so I'll talk about currently right now with the framework services and before this new API was introduced, um, the only sort of metadata that was supported by the framework services themselves were kind of core file object metadata, being file names, their URLs, the file size, and a checksum. And this is all information that we have to have in order to assign a persistent identifier or a GUID to a file object within the system. Um, before this metadata API, there wasn't any way to attach other arbitrary metadata uh, in the framework services. And so this new API allows for that. Um, there's a couple of um, requirements at the moment for this new API. One is that the, the metadata must be publicly available. So just like everything in IndexedD is publicly available, but the bytes of the objects themselves may not be publicly available. Um, the metadata in this API has to be publicly available. Um, the other requirement at the moment is that anything that gets added into this API is something that, that the Gen3 operators are able to pull from a different source. So whether that's a stable API like dbGaps, um, dbGap exposes a public API for uh, metadata about their samples. Um, so that's something that we can pull information from. Um, the other option is a static file within a bucket that is made available to us that contains metadata. We could also sync from that. Um, but the important thing here is that this is not metadata, this is not intended to be metadata that is manually curated by bioinformaticians or scientists. This is really metadata that's already available in a different source that we want available within Gen3 through this standard um, metadata API. And the last, um, kind of double-edged sword of this is that it is schemaless, um, so it's just a, a JSON blob. Um, so right now there's no um, programmatic enforcement of restrictions of the format of what you can add to this. Now of course we can have policies around what metadata is added um, and actually this being flexible makes it easier for different systems to choose how they want to use this and what data that they 
want to make available. Um, so those are the, the requirements for the API. And then I'll just show you real quickly um, what, it, what the API actually looks like. Um, so again, it's just JSON blobs. Um, so the API for this is actually fairly simple. So it's a, a, a CRUD API, create, read, update, delete. So there's maintenance endpoints for adding new metadata, for updating metadata, for deleting metadata. Um, but from the client perspective, um, the most important things are these uh, query endpoints. So the capability to query based on fields that are within the metadata is one endpoint. So you could say, give me, um, I want to know all of the GUIDs that match with uh, this specific study. Um, the other way is a direct uh, GUID metadata request. So I have a GUID, I want to know what additional information the Gen 3 Framework Services has about this GUID, um, what additional metadata they have. And then with that request, you would get back a blob of JSON with all of the additional metadata. Um, the example you're seeing on the screen is just uh, an example of some information that we pull from a public dbgap API. So you can see things like the submitted sample ID and dbgap, um, along with other things that dbgap makes publicly available. Okay, so the other thing that I want to touch on, and I guess reiterate, because I think um, the other speakers have, have mentioned this, but the framework services are really meant to be um, a collection of uh, standards that expose standard APIs that promote uh, systems being able to talk to each other. And so again, wherever possible, we're adopting these widely accepted standards like OIDC and OAuth2. We're adopting emerging standards from GA4GH like DURS and DURI. Um, and the, the idea is that eventually we'll have something that as long as everyone is talking the same language and has the same APIs, we can support this kind of ecosystem where researchers' lives are easier because the systems and that contain the data that they want to um, do research with um, talk to each other um, and can uh, enable kinds of cross analysis. Okay, so that is all of the content that we have. Um, I do want to just point out a couple of more helpful links and places where you can get more information. So again, all of our, uh, all of the Gen3 services and all of our software is open source under the Apache license. Um, you can go to our GitHub and go through the source code for Fence or Index.D or the metadata service. Um, and there's more documentation about each of those services through GitHub as well. Um, the other thing I want to point out is uh, we have done a number of webinars previously about Gen 3. We've talked more in depth about um, authentication authorization. We've talked about um, other portions of the Gen 3 stack in webinars, and you can access those webinars if you go to gen3.org. Um, there's some link, I think on the top right, like community resources um, or something, you'll find a way to get to um, our YouTube channel, which has uh, the recordings from our past webinars and also the previous slide decks. Um, and then additionally, if you're interested in talking with some of the developers kind of in a more um, async way, um, we have a community Slack channel that we'd be more than happy to add um, people to. So if you're interested in learning more about Gen 3 or interacting with us, um, please feel free to reach out uh, to any of us um, by any of these methods. Um, and then there's also a website here for the center as a whole. Uh, and then the last thing I want to touch on before we get to any questions, um, and again, if you have any questions, please feel free to post those in the chat, and we'll start to address them um, as we, as we uh, kind of wrap this up. Um, I just wanted to throw up a, a subset of where Gen 3 is being used. Um, so the framework services and other services that were talked about are being used um, within the NIH in a lot of different contexts. Um, uh, NHLBI, NHGRI, um, NCI, we have a number of different data commons um, that are utilizing both uh, the framework services and or other um, software offerings that Gen3 has in order to enable um, interoperability. And so the, the kind of um, perfect future that we see is that um, by using these open standards, um, and by adopting these open standards and APIs, we're, we're hopefully building an ecosystem where we're 
the end goal is making researchers' lives easier and making research reproducible and making results uh, happen faster and with less pain um, than previous. And so by adopting these standards, we're hoping that that's, um, that's what is made possible. And so with that, um, I will turn things back over to Andre. Um, and again, if there are any questions, um, please feel free to post those in the Zoom chat. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, Jachi, and Chris. At this moment, we'll transfer over to our Q&A section. Um, I will begin by asking this question that was raised. As I can see from the presentation, you will use fence access tokens for getting signed URLs for control data files. Are you gonna use RAS access tokens for the same thing? Or are you gonna use RAS refresh tokens for creating your fence access tokens? Either uh, Josh or Alex, please feel free to, to take this question. Uh, sure, I'm happy to take this question. So initially, um, we will just be using Fed's access tokens for, uh, you know, signed URL access within our DIRS server. Um, there's definitely conversations with the CRDC on, you know, how can we get to a federated approach where, you know, maybe we can just use RAS access tokens directly, but um, not quite there yet. So in the initial release um, targeted for the summer, we will be using um, fence access tokens for the DERS API. Um, yes, we will be using the RAS refresh tokens uh, on behalf of the user for creating those fence access tokens. So that is correct. Uh, in the RAS integration, fence will become an OIDC client of RAS and manage the user's RAS uh, refresh tokens on behalf of the user um, and access the user's visas and use that off the information to, to create FEDS access tokens. I hope that answered your question. Uh, please comment in chat if you have further questions. Okay, thank you, Jachi. Moving on to the next question. With respect to metadata API, isn't the more usual flow that you query the real word out attributes to identify objects you want to work with rather than starting from an object ID? Yeah, I, I definitely think that's the case. Um, and the the way that it's been designed is, um, so there's a couple of uh, background information that's useful. So the, the initial version of this is intended more so as a client facing API, not as a researcher facing API. And so what I mean by that is there's a number of clients within our systems in different contexts that um, need to obtain metadata programmatically behind the scenes um, about uh, information that's in Gen 3 and then expose a uh, search portal or UI on top of that. Um, and so the, the initial version of the metadata API is to support that client use case where we expect that that information is not going to be interacted with a user directly, but instead um, sent over to a different system to be uh, built on top of. Um, but I will say that the metadata API does support searching um, based on fields without using a GUID. So there's the give me all the metadata for this specific GUID or object ID, and then there's also an endpoint that is um, give me all the object IDs for uh, records that match my search query, which can be a combination of different fields that you care about. So, you know, everything within this specific dbGaP study or et cetera, et cetera. So both are supported, um, but it's definitely, a, I mean, it's, it's a new service. And so we're, we're always looking for different use cases and how to expand and make things easier for people. Um, but the initial use case was for, for clients specifically. Thank you, Alex. Our next question is, what is the difference between the DERS API and current index D capabilities? Sure, Jachi, do you want, do you want me to take that one? Uh, yeah. Um, so the, the DERS API as defined by GA4GH um, logically is a subset of what index D offers, um, but it's a more standard way of representing things. So before DERS, um, the framework services were still able to do what DERS is accomplishing just in our own way. And so DERS is just kind of a, a restructuring of what was already there into the more 
uh, standardized format by GA4GH. Um, so IndexD itself, I, I think the one thing that the DERS um, API is, is missing right now is the maintenance um, endpoints. And it's unclear if that will actually ever really become a part of the standard. But um, people who are operating these DERS servers have to have to really have to have ways to get data into the system. And IndexD has uh, approached this with a RESTful API. So you've got your typical uh, create, read, update, delete records within the system. Um, whereas DERS uh, just specifies the API for the read portion of that. Um, so it's the same information represented slightly differently for read, but IndexD has capabilities for um, restful ways to get data into the system. Yeah, and I guess I would add that the one new concept that there's um, introduced in, that IndexD have previously not had is the concept of bundles. Um, and that's something that we will be implementing as part of both, I guess, our regular IndexD implementation and also the DERS implementation. We have another question here. Why drivers only supporting open access attributes? There are a lot of important subject and sample attributes which are controlled access. Access to those subject and sample attributes goes with access to the object, so it's not a big deal. Yeah, so I can speak a bit about, um, so I'm gonna expand the, the topic beyond framework services and talk a bit about other Gen3 offerings. So, so Gen3 as a, an entire software platform offers a way to have a data model with controlled access attributes, um, but it's not part of our framework services. So that's enabled through um, some services that Jachi mentioned early on in the presentation um, for data dictionary support and submitting um, clinical or demographic information into the system. Um, and where that's used, we can control access. Um, this new metadata API, the intention was for it to be, again, with the, the first year use case being client facing with public information. Um, there's definitely room for us to expand the capabilities of the metadata API to support um, controlled access data. It's just not, um, was not in scope for this initial version of it, but it's something that we can definitely um, talk about, especially if there are um, research use cases within the framework services for enabling that. That's something that um, that's something that we can definitely talk about. Thank you, Alex. Um, at this time, I believe there are no more questions. So I want to thank our presenters, Jachi, Chris, and Alex, and I want to thank everybody for attending. We will be posting this recording so that. It it will be made available to everybody. So that concludes our meeting. Thank you much, everybody.